Today we're reviewing the Durston Gear CACWA 40 backpack, which is the backpack that I'm wearing right now. This is a 40 liter internal frame pack with two particularly unique features that I want to talk about in this review. The first one is the internal frame and suspension. The CACWA 40 uses a tubular um, shaped internal frame made of aluminum with some horizontal rigidity to it. That has a really profound impact on its ability to carry heavy loads and for the pack's torso to resist compression. And we'll talk about how uh, that impacts user comfort at heavier pack weights. The second feature I wanna spend some time on is the pack cloth that's used to make this uh, backpack. It's made by Challenge Sail Cloth. It's called EPL 200 commonly known as Ultra or Ultra 200. So we'll take a look at the specs behind this fabric, how it compares to popular Dyneema composite hybrid fabrics that are used in backpacks today, and its specific implementation in the Durston CACWA 40. The latter part of this video will focus on a fairly comprehensive Q&A where we'll talk about specific usability features, some more specifications, and load carrying performance. Uh, these questions came in from our community and it will kind of round out this review with what we've been experiencing in the field over the past few weeks with this pack. The first part of this video is going to focus on the performance of the CACWA 40's suspension. We're gonna talk about the parts of the suspension and how they work together. We're gonna to talk about how pack suspensions fail in general at their load limit and what impact that has on user comfort. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, if you're interested in buying a backpack or this pack specifically, how to relate the torso size that you measure to the torso size the manufacturer recommends and then your specific weight limits and use cases. First, let's take a look at what's on the inside of the pack in terms of the internal frame. So we've got two different sizes of CACWA 40s here. One is loaded, one is unloaded. So we'll pull the frame out of the unloaded one. The frame is secured in a back panel sleeve that is then secured by a Velcro strip. And then inside this panel sleeve is a piece of foam. And obviously that's not gonna provide any benefit to the suspension whatsoever, except perhaps a minor load distribution benefit because if you have a foam back panel, you can pull the load closer to your back and get more contact surface area. But for the most part, this is not a suspension component, it's a comfort component. So this is where it's at. This is the aluminum rod stock frame and the frame is threaded inside the backpack in a series of a couple of tubes. There's a pair of tubes that run right here to secure the uh, top of the frame to the top of the pack bag. And then there's another set of tubes down by the hip belt to make sure the end stays of the frame terminate and don't move around. So keep that in mind, if you remove the aluminum frame, make sure you um, insert the ends of the tubular aluminum through those webbing sleeves. So if we pull the frame out, this is what we got. It is a simple U-shaped frame that then tapers down or is bent downward so that the ends of the frame are on either side of the lumbar portion of the hip belt. And then you can see there is some bend to the frame here so that it can shape into and bring the load into that lumbar region. But this is the component that's kind of unique. We have some horizontal rigidity in the CACWA 40 that most packs don't have. Most packs are going to have twin aluminum stays that have no horizontal connection between them. And this horizontal connection does a couple of things. One, when you overstuff the pack, it prevents the pack from turning into a cylinder. It keeps a nice rectangular shape, which ultimately carries better because you have more contact surface area against your back to distribute the load. The second thing this horizontal component does is allow for much heavier weights to be packed into the pack without further compressing the frame. Now, part of that resistance to compression is going to be offered by tubular aluminum because tubular aluminum is more resistant to compressive bending than bar stock aluminum, which is what 
most internal frame packs have. Okay, so those are the interior components. Let's see how they interact with the rest of the suspension components of the pack. So you can visualize the frame of the backpack here, and you can see what I mean when I say there are sleeves in here that keep the ends of this rod stock aluminum stay in place so that weight coming down is transferred from the frame to the hip belt region, to the lumbar region. Often you will see packs where the frame stays are way out here in the edges of the pack and they don't terminate at the lumbar region and they tend to be very poor performers when it comes to uh, carrying heavy weights. Okay, so down at the bottom we have uh, padded hip belts that are about nine inches long and maybe four inches, four, to four and a half inches wide or tall. These two hip belt wings have a double webbing assembly and a single one inch buckle. Now this double webbing assembly allows the hip belt to be pulled into your iliac crest and shape better to your body than a single piece of webbing, which tends to create pressure points. Up in the shoulder strap region, we have two padded shoulder straps that are actually connected to each other in a yoke style harness. So they're not independent of each other. Some may not find this comfortable because uh, this fixes the shoulder straps in a particular position. There is some give here, so it will fit a variety of body types, but not everybody's body type. And, and no pack ever does fit everybody's body type. But just keep that in mind. Um, I never really had an issue with it. I was able to position the shoulder straps wide or narrow using the chest strap, so it wasn't a big deal to me. But keep that in mind if you have particularly broad or particularly narrow shoulders. Now the top of the aluminum frame sits at the top of the load lifters at this seam right here where the grab handle is sewn in. So you have a few inches right here of distance between the crest of the shoulder strap yoke and the seam where the load lifters are sewn in. And that seam is where the load lifters transfer weight from the uh, hips to the shoulders via this horizontal crossbar on the aluminum frame. So when the pack is loaded, you can operate the load lifters by simply pulling the upper straps down. Now there's a lot of controversy about load lifters and what their true uh, function is. In a mass market pack that's not customized to your body's dimensions, my personal opinion is that the load lifters are there to allow for the crest of the shoulder strap to be adjusted up or down a little bit to accommodate different torso sizes. The more practical benefit for the user out in the field is that the load lifters will be adjusted to accommodate uh, shoulder strap crest height in response to varying pack weights. So as you increase your pack weight, the torso length of the backpack is going to shorten and that means you might need to pull that load lifter up a little bit more to take some of that weight off the shoulders. So in theory, with a shoulder style harness, the shortest torso length should occur when the shoulder yoke is vertical to the back. And if we pull the load lifters just to that point and then fold down the shoulder straps, you can see the crest of the shoulder strap is now a little bit below the load lifter seam. Now, this is what I would call the shortest effective torso length of the pack. The longest effective torso length is the torso length that you get when you crank those load lifters down tight and pull the crest of the shoulder straps even higher. So now the crest of the shoulder straps is at the load lifter and the difference between those two uh, dimensions is only about an inch and a half. So there's not a lot of torso range adjustment available in the CACWA 40. Just keep that in mind as you pick a size uh, based on your torso length. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, let's take a look at some data now that show the shortening of the torso in response to increasing pack weight. Okay, we're gonna talk about this graph in the review right here. This review is linked below. In addition, I'll put a link to the article that describes the technique we use to generate this graph. This graph measures what we call the performance factor of a backpack suspension in response to weight. And the performance factor is a unitless, normalized mathematical equation that defines the extent to which a pack torso collapses as you add weight to it relative 
to the user's torso who we're testing it on. Now this graph shows the comparison of the Durston Gear Kakwa 40 to the Hyperlite Mountain Gear Junction, which is a twin aluminum stay backpack. Now most of these compression curves are straight lines and these two uh, don't differ from that norm. The junction, however, is a steeper line and the steeper a line is, the more likely the pack frame is going to collapse as you add heavier weights. And the point at which that line crosses the, the zero performance factor axis, that's what we define as the comfortable load carrying capacity. And I'll tell you why. Because at that weight, the torso length of the backpack now matches the effective torso length of the user. So if you add more weight, the backpack's going to further shrink down and the user is going to feel more and more that weight on their shoulders. That's going to be uncomfortable. And in that article where we developed the technique, we correlated the performance factor to perceived user comfort and there's a direct and strong correlation between the two. Now on the other hand, the CACWA 40 shows a much shallower slope, which means that frame compresses very little in response to added weight. In fact, the CACWA 40 is the best performing pack we've seen at the under two pound weight class. And it all has to do with the fact that you have an aluminum rod frame instead of a bar stock frame and a horizontal component. So rod stock is stiffer and the horizontal component allows for more effective load transfer and carrying ability without collapsing that frame. And in fact, at weights up to 53 pounds, the CACWA 40's frame still does not compress enough to become shorter than my torso because I did the test on my pack. Now, if you were to continue drawing that red line all the way out until it crosses the axis, uh, it might cross the axis at 55 or 60 pounds. And if you're trying to carry 55 to 60 pounds in a 40 liter pack, then you need some help that a stiffer frame cannot provide for you. But I do think it's very instructive to talk about how the CACWA 40 behaves at 40 to 45 pounds. Now for me, it's not tough to get to 40 to 45 pounds. I often camp um, above the tree line, away from streams on ridges and peaks, and I'm carrying water up to my camp. And most of the time I'm carrying eight to 10 pounds of water. So it's not uncommon for me to have a water carry that takes my small pack weight up to 40 pounds or so. Let's talk about pack fitting for a little bit. So in a typical pack that has a frame that collapses under heavy weights, you need a pack torso length that is substantially longer than your measured torso length. Now, when you measure your torso length, you're measuring it from the top of the iliac crest to the C7 vertebrae. Now that distance is taller than the iliac crest to shoulder crest distance. So manufacturers assume that if you measure from C7 to the iliac crest, that's gonna provide you that additional torso length that you need to fit into one of their packs. Problem arises when you load a backpack, especially these lightweight backpacks with minimalist suspension components, the torso length collapses to the point where you're now carrying a bunch of weight on your shoulders. And the most common reason is that you've undersized your backpack. I regularly look at a manufacturer's recommended torso length and size up. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised a few times that the manufacturer will accommodate some frame collapse in their torso length recommendations, but most of them don't. However, in the CACWA 40, you've got such a vertically stiff frame that resists uh, load compression that their torso lengths are actually pretty accurate. So my torso length from C7 to the top of the iliac crest is 17 and 3 8 inches, which is kind of right on the border between their small and medium. I went with the medium and I like how it feels all the way up to 50 pounds. The other pack fitting issue you should consider is where you're actually carrying the hip belt on your body. There are three primary options for positioning your hip belt. None of them are right or wrong. They have to do with your body type and your perception of comfort. The most common is to position the center of the hip belt over the top of the iliac crest. And with the double webbing hip belt strap like that on the CACWA 40, if you position the center line of the hip belt right at the iliac crest and then crank that buckle down, you're going to wrap the pad around the 
protrusion of the iliac crest. So you have some of the pad going over the crest, some of the pad then under the crest where there's more contact surface area to carry weight on your hips. For some people, this is the most comfortable way to carry the pack because it has the least probability of sliding down over your hips. Now, not everybody has a nicely protruding iliac crest. Now, for thinner people, they have two options. One is to hike up the uh, position of the hip belt so that it stays above the iliac crest, in which case your effective torso size is shorter than what you measure and you might be able to get away with a shorter frame pack. The problem with that option is that the hip belt then starts to interfere with your stomach. So if you carry any belly fat or you are a stomach breather, this could be uncomfortable for you. The other option is to drop the pack down low so that the entire hip belt pad uh, wraps around the lower part of the iliac crest so that the, the iliac crest is actually aligned with about the top of the hip belt pad. But wearing the hip belt lower below the iliac crest creates two additional problems. The first is that if you don't have hips with much shape to them, you're really going to have to crank that hip belt down as you add weight to your backpack to prevent the hip belt from sliding further down your hips and putting more weight on your shoulders. And that introduces the second problem. The tighter you crank down the hip belt on these big hip muscles right here, the more likely you're going to experience pain and even numbness in these muscles. This is the gluteus medius, and these muscles have a ton of nerve endings at the top of them that can be irritated by cranking a hip belt down too tight. But like I said earlier, everybody's body is different, and you're gonna have to find the pack fit location that works best for you most of the time at the weights you expect to be carrying in the pack. For me, I find that you know I'm carrying anywhere from 15 to 45 pounds, sometimes on the same trip, and I have to use various techniques in order to accommodate uh, a changing set of conditions and just weird pains in my body so that I'm not overtaxing particular spots all the time. In this part of the video, I want to talk about the fabric that's used to make the body of the Durston Kakwa 40. It's made by Challenge Sailcloth and its uh, fabric moniker is EPL 200. Most people know this on the market as Ultra 200. EPL is their line of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fiber fabrics. Now, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene is the same as 100% Dyneema or 100% Spectra. Don't get confused that this equates to Dyneema composite fabrics. That's a whole nother thing. Although Dyneema composite fabrics does contain ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fiber. Okay, back to the storyline. This fabric is a blend of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fibers and polyester fibers. It's blended in a ratio of two to one ultra high molecular weight polyethylene to polyester. So what we end up with is a fabric that is more abrasion and puncture resistant than pure polyester. And because ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fibers are very light, this is a lighter fabric than in an equivalent denier of polyester. These are 200 denier fibers. The second part of EPL 200 is the laminate backing. The backing is a 0.5 mil thick film of polyethylene terephthalate, PET. And that film is made separately and the fabric is woven separately. And then these two are brought together in a heat and pressure process to bond the PET film to the woven fabric. And that sandwich is EPL 200. Now let's contrast that with Dyneema Composite Hybrid, DCH. DCH fabrics are the most common pack fabrics used today. They're probably most well known in the body of the Hyperlite Mountain Gear series of backpacks. The specific type of fabric they use mostly on their pack bodies is DCH 150. 150 stands for 150 denier. So that's one difference between EPL and DCH 150. DCH 150 has smaller diameter fibers in the woven fabric face. In addition, in DCH 150, that woven fabric face is 100% polyester. So now you've got a woven fabric made of polyester in DCH that's more prone to abrasion and puncture than uh, the fabric that's used here, EPL 200. The second difference between EPL 
and DCH is the film. EPL uses PET film, DCH uses mylar film, reinforced with ultra high molecular weight polyethylene fibers. Because both EPL and DCH are laminates, they can delaminate. And the most common forms of delamination are going to occur at pressure points in the pack. They're gonna be places where there is a high amount of load stress on a seam, the seam itself caused by thread holes or grommets or um, lots of complexity in seam junctions. I've also experienced delamination of Ultra in a pack where the sharp corner of one of my cook pots was rubbing against the outside of the fabric all day long. I had not packed it carefully and it caused enough physical stress in the fabric to delaminate a little bit. That was not on the CACWA 40, it was on another brand of pack, but it was the same fabric. The laminated films, whether it's PET or Mylar, are waterproof and they are what give the packs their waterproofing. In addition, waterproofing is gonna be provided by seam construction and pack construction in general. Now on the Hyperlite packs, the DCH is sewn and taped. That makes for a perfectly waterproof seam. On the Durston CACWA 40, the seams are sewn and taped with a binding tape. They're not waterproof. Now, the question arises, does it remain waterproof uh, in real world conditions? Because, I mean, can water really penetrate seams? The answer is yes. And we'll talk a little bit more about waterproofing in the Q&A. But there is no question that the CACWA 40 allows more water to come in to the pack than a Hyperlite Mountain Gear DCH pack. We're in the Colorado monsoon here. We've got thunderstorms pending right now. And we have rain almost every day. And we've had rain almost every day for the past eight weeks. So my trips out here have been characterized by lots and lots of heavy rain during my hiking hours of the afternoon and evening. So I've come to strategize a little bit differently with the CACWA 40 about waterproofing, and I'll talk about that in the Q&A. Finally, let's talk about durability of the EPL 200 versus DCH 150. I've used several packs with Ultra 200 fabrics, and I will say this they are more durable than DCH 150. Not only from the standpoint of puncture resistance, but more importantly from the standpoint of abrasion resistance. Now I can poke sharp things through Ultra 200. It is not a miracle fabric by any stretch of the imagination. However, side by side with DCF 150, it is far more abrasion resistant than DCF 150. Now I'm gonna caveat that by saying DCF 150 is not an abrasion resistant fabric. My DCH packs have so many holes in them from rock sliding and scrambling that I'm constantly having to repair them and tape them. And I will warn you, Ultra 200 is not gonna solve all those problems. In fact, this is a very light fabric and it's not gonna be hard to create abrasion induced holes in it if you do a lot of desert or mountain scrambling. Don't have those expectations. It's a fine pack for bushwhacking, but this is not a rock scrambling pack. If you're looking for something like that, you're gonna have to graduate up to the heavier weight EPL series fabrics like Ultra 400 or even Ultra 800. Okay, I have several questions that were asked that I wanna go through to help round out our review of the CACWA 40, especially in terms of like, uh, usability and features and performance in unusual conditions and uh, some of that. So let's go ahead and get started. First question, is Ultra actually a better fabric than the Dyneema composite hybrids or is this another case of savvy, savvy marketing by the fabric maker and pack manufacturers? I think it is a better fabric. Um, it's stronger, it's more abrasion resistant, it's more puncture resistant. Uh, if you compare Ultra 200, EPL 200, to DCH 150, because that's a pretty fair comparison. The problem is don't expect a lot out of Ultra 200. It is still a lightweight backpack fabric. It's not fragile by any means. I've uh, bushwhacked through uh, wildfire zones and forest and done some mild rock, scr rock scrambling with it and it's done fine. But once I took it on desert and mountain granite that was sharp or limestone, it's not strong enough for that. So just keep that in mind and be careful when a manufacturer says, we are, this is a Dyneema composite hybrid killer. 
It might be, but it's not that much stronger at the light weights we're talking about. Now, if you are looking at Ultra 400 or Ultra 800, uh, these offer some compelling advantages to DCH and DCH's higher weights. And so uh, just keep that in mind. It's not a miracle fabric, but it's a, it's a good step in the right direction. Next question is, does the hip belt collapse under heavy loads or does it maintain lots of contact surface area with the hips? Um, this is a small hip belt. This, it's only four inches tall and about nine inches long, the, the hip belt wings. And so there's not much there that's actually going to collapse, especially with the double webbing uh, tension configuration. Now, once you get to 40 pounds, that hip belt starts to get uncomfortable. And this is why I'm hesitant to say that the comfortable load carrying capacity of the pack is 45 pounds. Even though we showed in our data that the frame can resist collapse at those weights, the hip belt and the shoulder straps are a little bit anemic for those pack weights. So my inclination is to say that this pack can carry 35 pounds comfortably, given the uh, lightweight hip belt and shoulder straps that it has on it, but don't expect it to carry heavier weights uh, comfortably for longer durations. When I had the pack loaded to 45 pounds and I was on the trail for several hours, I could feel the binding edge of that hip belt digging into my, my hips and it was, very, it was very uncomfortable. It caused me to have to adjust the pack several times as the day wore on so I could relieve some of those pressure points. Next question is how do you carry a bear canister in the CACWA 40? You can't. This is a small volume pack, 40 liters. So you might be able to fit a little weekender in there, but uh, you're not gonna fit um, something like an expedition inside the pack unless you put it in there ver vertically and carry <laughs> virtually no other gear. The other option you have is to carry the canister on top of the pack with the Y-strap. Now for a smooth sided canister like the carbon fiber barricade, you really need that barricade pack attachment webbing harness system thing and that allows the canister from sliding out of the Y loop. It's the same issue with the hyperlight packs. You can't really secure a canister um, and keep it from sliding back and forth on those straps and it's no different with the CACWA 40. The Y strap is fairly thin. The actual Y section is not long enough to cover the entire canister and so there's gonna be some limitations into how you carry a bear canister with the CACWA 40. The other issue is that if you are carrying a very full pack in the CACWA 40 and you have a canister that you need to strap onto the top of the pack, the Y strap is not long enough to secure around most bear canisters. So the only way to secure a canister effectively to the top of the CACWA 40 is to make sure that the gear inside the pack is well under the extension collar so that the canister sits well and makes a nice little concave uh, spot and does not have to try to either balance on top of this bulbous extension collar or um, it's so there's so much gear inside the pack that the Y strap is not long enough to secure the canister. Does the stiffer frame cause immobility fatigue over the course of a long day? I love this question and I love the term immobility fatigue. Um, this came about in the, in the 1990s when ultralight backpacking started coming on the scene, where the advantage to this soft, ultralight, pliable, frameless backpack was freedom and mobility. There was no frame to uh, confine your shoulders or your hips, and you just skipped down the trail and arrived at camp that evening after a 12-hour day turning cartwheels. That's not reality, of course, but there is some truth to the fact that very heavy overbuilt packs cause what we call immobility fatigue. And that's because your body is designed for freedom of motion. And when you're talking about repetitive motion on the trail for hours on end, if, if your pack is constricting that motion at all, it can transfer to your spinal chain or other joints and muscles and cause fatigue and pain. 
And so there is some sense that if you put a very stiff backpack on a person and then a heavy weight and make them walk for several hours, their muscles are going to fatigue because they're constantly fighting the motion of the backpack or the backpack's resistance to motion. I don't see that as the case in the Durston Kakwa. And the reason why is, yes, you have this horizontal uh, bar across the top of the frame. Yes, you have a very stiff frame vertically, but those, uh, the bottom of the frame is not fixed in motion. And so it has the chance to rotate around the hips. And this is where I see most immobility fatigue, where you've got a backpack that just does not allow for hip rotation and it causes back pain. I don't see that at all in the Kakwa 40. And for that matter, in most packs under two pounds. Next question is, can the zippers on the hip belt pockets and the left hand stash pocket be operated with one hand while wearing the pack? I can't universally say yes to this question. And the reason is, is because if the pack is underpacked and a little bit floppy, it's hard to operate the zippers with one hand. Um, the hip belt pocket zippers are easier to operate than the stash pocket zipper. The manufacturer has noted that if you uh, break in the zippers, they slide more smoothly. I, it's true. Um, I have several hundred cycles on my Kakwa zippers now, and it hasn't really changed it that much. I do find the hip belt zipper easier to operate than the stash pocket zipper. Even out of the box, the hip belt zippers on my Kakwa 40 were, they were much smoother sliding than the stash pocket zipper. The other issue is that there's no metal zipper tabs on these zippers. Uh, that drives me crazy, and here's why. First of all, why is the metal zipper tab removed? It cannot possibly be to save weight. I mean, this thing, these things do not weigh very much. The, the advantage to a metal zipper tab, a pull tab, is that it gives you enough stiffness to be able to push the zipper as needed, which is a really valuable technique if your pockets are understuffed and a little bit floppy. You only have cordage attached to the actual zipper and there's no pull tab, so it's hard to manip manipulate the zippers. Can you access a water bottle from the right-hand side pocket while wearing the pack? The right-hand side pocket is lower, has a lower top and an angled top, and it's actually pretty easy to access a water bottle. There's an art form to this, um, and it involves kind of reaching behind you, grabbing the bottom of the water bottle, and uh, pulling it slowly out of the pack, and then uh, putting it back the same way. And the reason that's kind of nice is that the higher you grab the water bottle, like if you try to grab it at the neck of the water bottle, this is where uh, you have to do some contortion in your shoulder and a lot of people think that this this is just not possible without dislocating the shoulder but the lower angled um, opening on that side pocket makes this process a bit easier. What is the maximum effective torso size of a human that can fit into each size pack? Okay take a look at the range of torso sizes on the Durston Gear website. There will be a range for small medium and large. If your torso falls on the border of one of those ranges, size up. And the reason is because there's not a lot of uh, space between the crest of the shoulder strap when the yoke is tilted up and the load lifter seam. And so sizing up a little bit may give you a little bit more freedom to uh, pull the pack weight off your shoulder some. That said, I wear my hip belt around my iliac crest, so I'm, I'm one of the middle people, and I like weight off my shoulders. Now I sized into a medium, even though my torso measurement from C7 to uh, the iliac crest was right on the border between small and medium, I'd be tempted to try a large. Um, I think the large would give me the flexibility to, uh, when I'm carrying a heavy load, to wear my hip belt a little bit lower just to take some of the pressure off the top of the iliac crest a little bit and it would give me more flexibility up and down in how I wear the pack. Is the pack reliably waterproof even though the seams aren't taped? What are the primary sources of water ingress into the pack bag? It's through the seams. Uh, the seams are not taped, they are bound and in an all day rain, water will enter the backpack. One of the things I really like about Dyneema composite hybrid fabrics is that they absorb very little water. And so if you take a pack like the Hyperlite Mountain Gear 
uh, junction or wind rider or porter and it's got a great roll top closure where you can roll it several times down to create a good seal at the roll top. So these packs, as long as there aren't holes in them, uh, are, are durably and reliably waterproof. The EPL 200 fabric itself is quite water resistant and does not absorb a lot of water. But this is a higher denier weave and water does get into those bigger pores. And so you do uh, gain a little bit of weight if this pack gets soaked. So what's the best strategy for keeping your gear dry in um, a backpack that has fabrics that you know start to creep up in weight like this? Um, a pack cover. A pack cover has always been the most effective strategy at keeping water weight out of your pack. If you have a pack liner or waterproof sacks inside your pack, that's great. It keeps your gear dry, but it does not serve to keep your backpack dry. Now that said, the water absorption um, into the CACWA 40 is going to be primarily into the spacer mesh that's used in the shoulder straps and hip belts. And because those are body contact areas, they're going to be slow to dry. So that's true with any pack. So my hope is that the Durston Gear will come out with a custom fit pack cover for the CACWA 40. Next question is, what's your strategy for carrying as much water as possible in such a small pack? This is a great question. So I'm often carrying uh, five or six liters up to my high camps at night and I will do so primarily with an overflow water bag, a three liter water bag. In my other packs, my bigger packs, I can stow the three liter water bag sideways in the top of the pack and I can't do that in the CACWA 40, it's not big enough. So now I've resorted to carrying multiple smaller bottles. My main drinking water bottle is a 24 ounce wide mouth bottle and then my overflow bottles are either hydro packs or platypus bottles. So I've kind of ditched my three liter hydro pack out of this pack and have replaced it with two two liter hydro packs. And then I have two rigid water bottles that I will take that I'll put in my side pockets. And those two liter hydro packs then lay on the top of the rest of my gear inside the main pack bag. And this keeps the center of gravity of my pack weight as close as possible to my back. Next question, is each of the double webbing straps on the hip belt independently adjustable? No, they are not. They are, they slide through the side release buckle loop on the hip belt buckle and then back to a ladder lock, that's your point of adjustment. There's only one ladder lock point of adjustment. This seems like it could be an issue because if both of the webbing loops are independently adjustable, um, it allows you to dial in the tension on the upper and lower portions of the hip belt. If you look at the larger hip belts on McHale packs, they have two pieces of webbing, two buckles, they're independently adjustable. I don't think it's necessary on a belt that's only four inches tall. So um, I would say it does not have a huge impact and I wouldn't worry about it. What parts of your body start to get uncomfortable as you approach and exceed the CACWA 40's weight carrying capacity? Uh, definitely my hips. I can feel the binding on the hip belt fins dig into my gluteus medius muscles as well as my hip bones. So that's where I feel it first. And to me, that is the limitation to carrying weight in the CACWA 40. How much does the internal frame and internal foam pad weigh? If you remove them, is the CACWA 40 a functional frameless pack? I don't know how much they weigh, a couple ounces? It doesn't matter, don't remove them. Um, it, it's not a functional frameless pack. In fact, it's a floppy, um, collapsible kind of mess. It's not designed to be a frameless pack. The only reason these components are removable is because most components are removable on internal frame packs. It makes for easier construction and assembly. It doesn't mean that you should remove them to save weight. You're defeating the purpose of the whole point of the pack. Is the rear pocket mesh durable while bushwhacking? Do you wish that pocket was made with ultra fabric? No, I don't. I like the mesh pocket. I like the ability to stow wet gear in a mesh pocket. And honestly, this brings up another issue with the CACWA 40 that uh, needs to be addressed, and that is drainage. Uh, there's no drain holes in the bottom of the pack body, and there's no drain holes in the bottom of the side pockets. So this is all ultra construction, and so what you end up in an all-day rain is puddles in the bottoms of your pack and pockets. And, you know, I keep my sleeping bag at the bottom of my my backpack, I don't, I don't want it sitting in a puddle. 
or otherwise accumulating water that drips or wicks its way down the inside of the pack fabric. And then back to the mesh rear pocket, uh, in terms of bushwhacking, you don't really spend a lot of time bushwhacking with the mesh in contact with the bush. You have much more uh, abuse to the side pockets, and so I kind of like that. The only scenario I do wish it was ultra is for rock scrambling if I'm back sliding down while wearing the pack or squeezing sideways through slot canyons. The, that kind of stuff obviously can tear up the mesh pretty bad. The next question, I'm a larger woman with wide hips. Do you think the CACWA 40 is appropriately designed for me and what would be the main thing to watch out for when it comes to pack fitting? Uh, there's a fair bit of adjustment in the width of the webbing or the hip belt. However, it's not as much as you think. And if, you're, if you have wide hips or a wide waist, be cognizant of the fact that it can be difficult to tighten those hip belt straps. They're not long enough for me, and I have a 32 inch waist, to grab the strap uh, with my full hand and tighten it until it's already been tightened a little bit. So there, there's not as much uh, room as I had hoped for or thought in terms of excess strap length. So that's one thing to be aware of. Second thing to be aware of is that it's a fairly thin hip belt. And if you're a wide hipped woman, you might consider bringing that hip belt a little bit higher so that it uh, wraps around the uh, top of the iliac crest rather than the wider part of your hips where it's going to interfere with your gluteus medius muscles. And that means that you might be able to get away with a lower torso length rather than a longer torso length pack. If you were to add four ounces or less to the pack to make it more capable, what would you add? It's a great question. I would add Ultra 400 or Ultra 800 onto the bottom of the pack just so that it could deal with the, that portion of the pack that gets abused the most. I'd also like an ice axe loop, drainage grommets, more webbing on the Y strap and hip belts, and zipper pull tabs, but that's about it. But what would really make this a capable pack is to make it in a bigger size. A CACWA with this frame and uh, pocket layout in a 55 to 70 liter range would be a fantastic pack because of its load carrying ability. Next question, is the spacer mesh and padding on the inside face of the hip belt sufficient for keeping the pack from slipping down your hips when loaded at its weight limit? No, not at the upper weight limit. So if you're looking at carrying 45 or 50 pounds in this pack, it's definitely gonna slip down your hips, but it stays in place remarkably well at 35 to 40 pounds for me. It's really gonna depend on your body type. If people are rails and they have no hips, then you're gonna have some slippage for sure at higher weights. One thing that would greatly benefit the CACWA is to have a lumbar pad down here between the hip belt. That would make for a more continuous contact surface area without slippery fabric there, and you could bring that hip belt in a little bit tighter and bring the pack close into your hips at the heaviest weights. Next question, any fabric delamination issues? Uh, yes, but they're very minor. They're only around the seam junctions inside the pack that are both weight bearing and where you have three pieces of fabric coming together. So you've got this complex, very busy seam. I just don't see this causing a problem. I've used several ultra backpacks. They have all had delamination issues, but nothing widespread that would cause you know, massive leaking or uh, a loss of structural integrity of the fabric. But this is a new fabric. It's only been on the market for a year and the number of people who've had these packs um, in use every day is pretty limited still. And so we really need to understand how these packs are gonna behave on through hikes in wet climates. And we just don't quite have that much data yet. I will say one thing about delamination on EPL fabrics and DCH fabrics versus something like coated nylons. Coated nylons with polyurethane coatings tend to hydrolyze. And so the more you expose it to moisture, the more likely these coatings are going to peel off and cause your pack to leak. Very, very common. With laminates like, like EPL 200 and DCH 150, they're not really subject to hydrolytic delamination. They are subject to mechanical delamination. So wherever there's a lot of physical stress on the fabric, you're going to have a higher risk of delamination. So just be careful where you're packing sharp things in your pack so that they're not rubbing against the same spot over and over all day long. And 
just keep an eye on the seam areas because that's where you're going to see uh, delamination occur, especially the seams that are carrying structural stress in the pack. The two takeaways I want you to have with this pack are the frame does not collapse under very heavy loads. Ultimately, even if you're never carrying a very heavy load, what that means is you're going to have more consistent comfort across the entire range of weights you will be carrying in this pack compared to a pack that uses a more minimalist suspension like twin aluminum stays. The second takeaway is you have a lot of organization options and they're very good. You have this double layer pocket on the left hand side, you have this water bottle accessible pocket on the right hand side, this rear mesh pocket on the back, two shoulder strap pocket, two hip belt pockets, and a decent sized main compartment of about 40 liters. Here's what I can fit into the pack. I can put a 20 to 40 degree quilt or sleeping bag in the bottom. I can have my Nemo Tensor wide regular pad. I can carry a two person single wall tent like the Durston X Mid Pro. I can carry a puffy layer, which in my normal three season temperatures is an enlightened equipment toward apex pullover. Rain jacket, rain pants, a light and thin alpha fleece hoodie, long underwear bottoms, hat, gloves, wind shirt, toiletries, first aid, repair, a cook kit in a 700 milliliter pot, and a large fuel canister, enough food for five days, and all the other little things that you need for backpacking in the wilderness. All of that gear fits inside the backpack or in the external pockets. If you're gonna be out for more than about five days, you may have to store something outside the pack. When I've had to do this, the tent usually goes outside the pack and gets strapped under the top Y strap of the pack. Finally, the million dollar question is, is it comfortable? I can't answer that for you. I am one data point. Andrew, who co-wrote the review with me is the other, other data point we have. We both like it. We've figured out how to make it comfortable at the pack weights we're, uh, we're packing the CACWA with. And granted, Andrew and I have different body types and we carry the pack differently. So don't believe anybody who says this is the most comfortable pack they've ever tried. Don't take that as it's going to be comfortable for you. Comfort is a very subjective thing and it depends a lot on the individual, not just your body type and shape, but your tolerance for discomfort as well. But regardless of what type of pack you use or what type of pack you're shopping for, look for ranges of adjustability that allow you some flexibility in how you carry the pack and how you adjust it so that you can dial in comfort that works for you when you are carrying the heaviest loads. Okay, that's it. We'll see you next time. Happy trails, everybody.